So we're already with 92 people. So I think we're gonna get slowly started. Some more people will join, that's, uh, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna put up uh, some slides here. So uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Of course, we are in uh, strange times with uh, the coronavirus and um, I hope you're all okay and healthy and I hope your family is also and I hope you um, will get through these uh, very tough times that everybody's facing all over the globe. And uh, Kurt and me, we were thinking about what we could do and um, you know, the open source world uh, tries to get the people together and we thought it would be a nice thing to have um, a webinar where we just introduce the topics in our book, get through it and uh, answer a few of your questions and then have some geo beers to have a bit of cheer in this uh, time when everybody's uh, or many people are staying at home. I'm also working uh, at home now for a week and um, yeah, try to do good things and keep the faith and still uh, guide my students. So we'll have these webinars uh, every week for seven weeks long. And um, based on the book, So I'm going to introduce myself for the people who don't know me. So I'm uh, Hans van der Kost. I'm a senior lecturer at IHE Delft Institute for Water Education in uh, Delft, the Netherlands. I'm doing this on a personal title uh, these uh, Friday evenings. Um, my background is that I'm a physical geographer. I did my master's and my PhD at Utrecht University at the Department of Physical Geography in the Netherlands. Um, then I was a researcher at the Flemish Institute for Technological Research in uh, Belgium. Vito and studied uh, land use change modeling and uh, water quality modeling, those topics. And there I got really into open source. And since 2012, I work at uh, IHE Delft as a lecturer. I'm a board member of the Dutch uh, QGIS user group. And my main interests are open source GIS, obviously, and uh, modeling. I'm like Kurt, uh, a QGIS certified instructor. So all our trainings, uh, give the right to, uh, uh, to have the participants to get the official QGIS certificate, uh, where in, in that way we also contribute to QGIS. Um, I'm interested in remote sensing for hydrology. I do a lot with that at IHE Delft. And in my projects, I work on uh, data sharing, on open data and uh, spatial data infrastructures. We'll also be a part of one of the, the chapters that we're going to do during the webinar. And uh, yeah, they all think we are super uh, computer nerds. We are, but uh, field work is also important. So we need to always see the link between uh, what we see in the field and uh, go out there, measure it with devices and come back to our computers to process the data and uh, do the interpretation. You can reach me uh, through my email address or on social media. And uh, yeah, good to be around with you. So here's uh, Kurt, I'll give him the mic. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, I'm Kurt Menke, and I'm uh, the co-author on, on the book QGIS for Hydro Hydrological Modeling. Um, I got my geography degree from the University of New Mexico, and that's where I'm based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I operate my own consulting business, Bird's Eye View. I'm an OSGEO charter member, and it's hard to believe at this point, but I've authored six books, authored and co-authored six books on QGIS at this point. The QGIS for Hydrological Applications is the most recent one, and I also published Discover QGIS 3X last year, which is a large workbook for anyone wanting to learn um, a, a really thorough treatment of all the capabilities in QGIS. Um, I'm a QGIS certified instructor, and with Hans, I help manage the QGIS certification program for the QGIS project. And I do a whole mix of um, spatial analysis and cartography and teaching with my business. And I've also, um, in the last year, helped start a new initiative called the Q Cooperative, which is myself and a number of other power users and core developers of QGIS um, located around the world. And we're there to provide support services. So if people need um, customizations to QGIS, new features, plugins, training, things like that, we can help. So the, you can see all the URLs and how to contact me there. Great, Kurt. So um, we'll have uh, seven uh, webinars. This first one is about preparing data from hard copy maps. I will go uh, into the details in a bit. The second one next week, so every Friday we'll do this, is about importing tabular data into QGIS. The third one is about spatial analysis with map algebra. So mostly the raster uh, things that you can do in QGIS. 
Then chapter four, very important for um, hydrologists and people in water management is stream and catchment delineation. And the fifth session is about adding open data to your catchment. And I'm thinking of doing maybe something with a mapathon related to that. So I'll keep you posted on those ideas. Um, the sixth topic is uh, calculating the percentage of land cover per sub catchment where we do some uh, vector analysis. And the seventh one, Kurt will show you everything about uh, map design and to make these nice uh, catchment maps like we also have on the cover of our book. This book is now um, uh, on a discount because it's uh, World Water Day uh, this Sunday. And uh, I will give you the, the coupon code uh, at the end. Um, it's uh, QGIS Hydro. And if you order the book through the link uh, on this uh, slide, then you can uh, get 30% discount until this Sunday. And certainly to have the book next to you is, uh, is useful uh, when you follow these webinars. Okay, so for today we are uh, preparing data from hard copy maps. Uh, please mute your microphone if you're not talking, otherwise I have to mute you in some way. Um, so it will be about uh, georeferencing uh, a scanned map. And uh, using the georeferencer GDOT plugin, there will be a few other plugins introduced. And then after we have done the georeferencing, checking of course the results and digitizing uh, the vector layers in a geo package. So we're not going to use a shapefile in, in this uh, exercise, but we're going to use a geo package. Uh, we'll follow uh, more or less the steps in the book. Sometimes we will add more. Um, you can also ask your questions in the chat box to, uh, to Kurt. And, um, of course, the book is more detailed and has all the steps, so uh, this is not uh, comparable to a course. We will give you at the end some uh, ideas of courses you could follow if you want to learn more about this. So I'm going to switch to uh, Qt. I'm going to first share uh, the map that we're going to uh, georeference. So this is just a picture. It's a JPEG file and um, it comes without coordinates. So this is just a, a JPEG that uh, you can have after, uh, um, after uh, downloading the course data from the book. And what you see here, uh, you can open the, the picture in any editing program that you have. And you have to always inspect the map before doing anything in GIS. So we're going to inspect if we can find any coordinate information on this uh, map. And we find here different coordinate systems. We find here something that we can recognize as uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. Here there's a number that is related to this grid. We see a grid on the map. It says 581,000 meters east and then 582, but they remove the zero, so it goes here into kilometers. Then there's here something in minutes and uh, degrees or in inches. And, and feet, not so clear. So this is a real map. Here we see feet. So let's see what the map says about this projection. It's a bit of a complicated one um, because you have to read a few things. And if we read this, we see here that the projection and thousand meter grid is zone 18 of universal transverse Mercator. So that means UTM, zone 18. And it's United States of America, so that is uh, Northern Hemisphere. So we already know that it's UTM uh, North, zone 18. And we are going to use the, this grid to georeference because this grid gives us the nodes where we can read the coordinates from the sides. So if we can select those nodes in the software and indicate the coordinates that belong to those nodes, then uh, we can georeference the map. So there's some other information here. There was in that time a translation to another uh, datum, but the datum of this map is the 1927 North American datum. And then there are some other information on how to deal with this map if you want to transfer the coordinates. So that's very important information. So before we uh, proceed, we need to look up this uh, projection and get the EPSG code. So in open source uh, software, we often use the EPSG code to um, identify the projection. That's very useful because if you work with people together, you only need to share your EPSG code and everybody works in the same projection. 
uh, if you manually choose projections, and you might have done that in your work, then uh, if you choose the wrong one, it can be slightly wrong and it's very hard to, um, to correct that afterwards. So if you want to know the EPSG code of this projection, you can go to a website, um, which is called uh, spatialreference.org. I'm gonna put it up, it's this website. And uh, what we have read is that it's uh, UTM, it's zone 18, it's Northern Hemisphere, and it's North American datum 1927. Now, this is a search engine, but not as clever as Google. So you need to be rather precise. So if you don't know how to abbreviate NAD as a search uh, term, then you have to look and interpret uh, this list. And we see here NAD 27, that must be North American datum 1927. So if we write it then, NAD 27, then our list gets uh, much shorter. And also this is a bit like in Google. So you're looking for something specific, but Google gives many pages back. And this doesn't give many pages because we were quite precise in um, what, what we asked uh, to the search engine, but we still get three codes here. And the rule is, well, don't look at what you're not looking for. So we were not looking for 76 or CGQ 77. We were specifically looking for this one. So that's the one we need to choose. When I click on, uh, on the link, then it gives me some more information. Uh, description, I can download this project information in all kinds of formats. But what's important for us is to use this EPSG code. So I'm gonna copy it to memory. So I can use it in GIS. So now it's time to uh, move to uh, QGIS. So I'm going to share the QGIS screen. And uh, what I'm using here is uh, QGIS uh, 3.10, uh, the LTR version, so 3.10.3. 3 um, there are newer versions, but for operational use, and especially also if you're a lecturer, you want to use a stable version uh, where your course material uh, continuously works. So the newer versions are, are also quite stable unless you uh, maybe use the nightly builds, but they can have some uh, things uh, that, that have been broken while updating. So to, or things that work differently. Um, so for courses and for operational use, it's always wise to install the LTR version that you can find on QGIS.org. So I have here uh, an empty uh, project. And uh, what I'm going to do is first install um, the right plugin. And this is a, a core plugin. So it already comes with QGIS. So for this one, for the core plugins, you don't need to have an internet connection. For the others you need. And I'm going to look for the georeferencer GDAL plugin. It's here, it's already checked here. If it's not checked in your case, you check the box and then it's activated. And then you'll find it under the raster menu. And there we see the georeferencer tool. If I click on it, it starts a new window. It's always wise to maximize it because we are going to use uh, uh, the space here on the screen to do the georeferencing. It's not a good uh, idea to do that on a very small part of the screen. Uh, you can also dock this uh, to uh, QGIS. So there are some settings here that you can look at, configure georeferencer. Um, some nice ones is like use map units if possible for the residual uh, units, you can play with that. Uh, and show georeferencer window docked. That is a nice one if you want to do image to image uh, georeferencing. Uh, I'll come to that later. That's uh, not covered, but uh, I'll show you where you can find how to do that and why you need to do that sometimes. So let's start uh, adding our picture, the JPEG. So I click on this button and uh, it's there. Chapter one of the book comes with the book data. And uh, there it is. If you get a pop-up to uh, indicate the projection of this map, you need to click cancel. Because this map doesn't have the projection yet, it is just a picture and it has the coordinates from uh, the file. You see them in the lower right. These are not uh, projected coordinates, but that's just rows and columns in this uh, file. So what we need to do is a few things before we can start georeferencing. We can click this button to set the transformation parameters. And if you don't know anything about uh, the type of transformation needed, 
it's always wise to start with the linear one. So linear means that it's just a rotation and a scaling of uh, the map. If that doesn't give good results, and we will see later uh, how to interpret the errors, then you can use the other way. So polynomials, for example, which are more uh, complex fits through the points that you're going to identify in ground control points. Let's start with linear and see what happens. Then the resampling method. So if we are going to do uh, georeferencing, we are going to calculate new grid coordinates. And yeah, the risk of that is that uh, yeah, we need to resample and you need, need to choose a resampling method. And if you want to do calculations, so the rule is if you want to do calculations, you choose the nearest neighbor. If you want to use this map for visualization, then you can use a cubic or cubic spline. In this case, I want to use it to digitize vectors. So I choose cubic. If you have a satellite image and you want to do calculations or a DEM, you need to use nearest neighbor. Uh, by the way, this is the way uh, to do it for the raster data. For vector data, there are other approaches. So I choose here cubic, and then I need to choose the target uh, projection. And I'll do that with this button. So here you can choose the projection. In some cases, it's grayed out. Then you need a workaround. And the workaround is uh, published uh, on, the, on the website of the, uh, the book. Um, so you can see how to, to do that. In my case, it still uh, works, but I saw with many students that it doesn't work like this anymore. So the trick is, if it doesn't work, that you set the projection of your uh, project. So I'm going to paste here the EPSG code that I found on the spatialreference.org website. So you can always write in the filter the name of the projection, but also the EPSG code. And, uh, and I can choose it, and here it is. You can see approximately where it is on the globe using this uh, map, and you get here a textual description in the well-known text format. And that's indeed the one we need. So I'm gonna choose this, click OK, so now it's defined. Where do I wanna save my output raster? I wanna save it in the same folder. Also note for good practice that we uh, use underscores and not spaces in file names and folders, very important. And um, yeah, it automatically adds this modified, underscore modified to the file name. So I keep it like that, so to distinguish it from the original file. I'm not gonna change anything else here, but I would like to change this one to check this box, loading QGIS when done. That means that in the end, after indicating all the ground control points, so that's what we're going to do, that when it's finished, it loads the result, so this modified file in the canvas of QGIS and I can continue working with that. Okay, so these are the settings. And then we can start digitizing our uh, ground control points. And we do this with these three buttons. So this one is to add the point, that's to delete a point, and this is to move the GCP to another location. So we have found out that this grid on the map is related to that projection that we have indicated. So we are going to read these numbers and we're going to identify ground control points on the nodes of the grid. And uh, we're going to use uh, four. So at least four are needed to do this a little bit accurately. More is always better. For this demo, I'll use four. And what's also important is that you maintain a good spread over the map because the, uh, the inaccuracies of the hard copy map, they are spread over the map. And if you want to georeference it, it's important that you spread your points over the map. Otherwise, it's only accurate in one corner. So I'm going to add the points, I'm going to zoom in move it a bit to the center of the screen. And you zoom in really well. It's important that this, that this job is done accurately. And I place the first point here in the center of the pixel. And now I'm gonna read the values from the side of the map. So this is the, the X and that is the Y. So don't confuse them, then your error will be low, but you will get uh, an upside down, inside out kind of map. So that's five, eight, one thousand meters east and four eight eight five thousand meters north. This is a real scanned map so you can see that the resolution is a, is a real thing. It's not a perfect map uh, because of the scan. You see wrinkles here. 
So, yeah. Okay, now the first point is set here and it fills in the source coordinates of the file and uh, the destination in our UTM projection and the residuals. I'm going to another corner here. I'm going to use this one. Here you already see that the map was a little bit rotated during the scan, it becomes a bit fuzzy. So I'm gonna estimate that it's approximately here. And then I read the values from the side. 599, remember that it omitted the zeros because it's meters, so I need to add the three zeros. And the other one here, 4886000. And that's our second point. I'm gonna continue with the third point. It needs at least three points to estimate the accuracy, I'll show you. Now, now you see already some uh, residuals, but uh, with two points, that's like standing with three people in a, in a row. Uh, if you were allowed again to stand in a row, <laughs> then, uh, then you're with three people and two are outside and you say that the others are not in the row, that doesn't make much sense. So you need more points to determine what is in the right order. So uh, can use this point maybe. Let's use this one. If I make a mistake and put it here, uh, I have to type something here. Let me put it here and then type the coordinates and I'll show you how to remove it. So this is 5998000 and 4873000. Okay. Now there are a few things you see. It calculates now the residual because we have uh, three points and with this red line it indicates the proportion of that er error and uh, the direction of that error. And of course, yeah, with this button, we can delete the whole point if I click on it. But with this one, we can move it. And I can put it in a better location. So approximately here. Yeah. So I'm going to do the fourth point and see what happens with the residuals. So don't base uh, too quickly com conclusions on too little points. Let's use this one, it's a nice one here. And I add the point. And then the coordinates are 5810000 and 4873000. Okay, there we are. It's always good to check if you have systematic errors. It uh, doesn't seem like that. You can always check if you miss a zero there. You can easily make typos. I've seen all kinds of varieties. Um, so uh, this seems okay. And then here it says the mean error, which is 39.6562 pixels. And that's a bit too large. That's approximately this red line. So for each point, it displays the error with these red lines. And uh, this is an indication after checking all these points that we need another kind of transformation. So if I go back to the settings, I'm now going to put it on the first order polynomial. If I do okay now, I see that the error drops to less than one pixel, 0 0.44. It will still uh, plot uh, the point with the, the error. Let me find back uh, one of the points here, here. So you see now that the error is within one pixel. So that's acceptable. You will not always achieve this accuracy. So it's not a rule that the error needs to be always within a pixel. Sometimes it's simply impossible. Um, so it depends on the purpose of your uh, georeferencing. So I've set all these points and I accept this error. So we can start doing the georeferencing. And you do that by uh, pushing this button, start georeferencing. There we go. And it gives here a, a warning, and I think that should be okay. This is in the older versions, uh, not the case, but I'm just accepting it in this case. It has to do with some updates on the, the projection library. And I can simply close this window. It will ask to save the ground control points. I could save them. And uh, here I see the georeferenced map. If it looks inside out, mirrored, <laughs> then you did something really wrong. 
in this case, it, uh, it makes sense. But now we need to check if it makes sense. And uh, yeah, there were also some bugs with the projection uh, in, in older versions uh, of, of this uh, 3.10 series. So uh, let's see if uh, this results in the right coordinates. Now how to do that is what if I sample the coordinate of this point, this point and see if it's that, that's the same as written here on the corner. And I can do that with the coordinate capture tool. That's also a core plugin, so if you don't have it, you'll find it here, coordinate capture tool, and you just need to check the box, and then you have it here. And it opens this uh, pane here, and I can click uh, start capture. I zoom in on this pixel, and I click, and the first one is in latitude longitude, and the second one is in our projection. And uh, let's see again if that makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty close to what we have uh, chosen. So uh, that's, uh, that's perfect. So that's one way of checking. So always do that. Never believe uh, what comes out of the software. Always check it. You can make mistakes. There can be bugs. Um, another way to check it is to use an online map. Because, yeah, it will be very hard for you to challenge that the whole world was wrong and your map is okay. So uh, let's see how it looks like uh, if we have OpenStreetMap or the Google Satellite in the background. For that, you need a plugin that is called uh, the Quick Map Services plugin, this one. I already installed it. And then it comes here in the menu. At first, you will see a shorter list than I have here on the screen. So what you can do is go to settings. You only have to do that once. And then you go to more services and you click get contributed back. And then you will have uh, the list like I have it here. So I'm going now to um, choose the OpenStreetMap. And I use here the OSM standard, and it will load through the internet. And uh, I can check if the lakes uh, correspond. And you can do that by uh, clicking uh, space. You can toggle. So I'm clicking the space bar now. That's one way. You can also work with transparency. So here. Um, I clicked on this button to open the live uh, styling uh, panel, layer styling panel. And here I can play around with the opacity. So I can see how good OpenStreetMap matches with uh, our georeferenced map. <clears throat> Another way of doing it is with uh, blending. That's something uh, quite unique for QGIS. So if I do blending uh, on multiply, we can see the OpenStreetMap uh, true. It mixes OpenStreetMap with this uh, result. Another nice uh, plugin is the Map Swipe plugin, where you can move around. Maybe if we have time, I can demonstrate that. Um, another thing to do to compare it is use from, Open, uh, from the Quick Map Services, the Google Satellite. Here. So I'm going to. We move the OpenStreetMap standard, and I'm going to blink the screen, and we see that the lake is there. And uh, yeah, makes sense. We can also blend it. So let's see what happens if I blend this. We don't multiply. And now we see the satellite blended with uh, the map that we georeferenced. So this is a, quite a proof that it's a good fit, because if it fits with global data through internet, then, then that's OK. Okay, now, the, now we have a nice uh, backdrop to digitize. Uh, let's start digitizing. That was the second task. Uh, we're uh, halfway uh, the webinar. It's 9.30. We have 167 uh, participants. I hope everything's fine with you. Um, so let's start with uh, creating a geo package with uh, points. And what we're going to do is we are going to uh, digitize a few of these mountains which have the elevation value uh, with them. So there are some peaks here and some have uh, elevation values. And I think it's better to look in this corner here. We have a few here. And we can digitize those uh, points. Here's Mount Marcy. 
Meiti, or some other mountains. So let's start. We go to uh, layer, create layer, new geo package layer. So the difference between a shapefile and a geo package is that uh, in a geo package, well, there are many differences. A shapefile is quite a, uh, a common format, but has a lot of disadvantages. I'm not going to give a whole uh, lecture on that. But basically, a geo package is a database, and you can store points, lines, polygons, rasters, but even your styling and your whole QGIS project in one file-based database that you can share with others. And with a shapefile, you have to always share uh, multiple files. It uh, has limitations to the amount of characters on uh, the data management, etc. So in uh, this case, we can um, use geo package uh, to also propagate the use of that. So I'm going to browse to my uh, folder, the webinar folder, and I'm going to create a new uh, database, which I call uh, Mount Marcy. And the extension of a geo package is GPKG. So that's the name of the database. Now in the database, you create your layers. So our first uh, table will be peaks. And we have to identify the geometry, it will be points. And we identify the projection. And we can use this drop down list to choose a projection that we've already used. So this one, that's of our, from our project. It's also here, this is the on the fly reprojection. You can uh, check my videos on projections if you want to learn more about that. And the first one, uh, fields. So these are the, the fields in the attribute table, the columns where we're gonna identify uh, uh, our elevations first. Elevation. That's of course not text data. In this case, we will use a whole number integer. And never forget to push this button. Many people forget it and then nothing happens because you need to add it to this fields list. Then, Another uh, name that we put here is the name of the mountain. So let's put just name there. And we choose here uh, text, uh, text data, and I add it to the list. So there are two columns here in the attribute table, and I click OK. Um, now we can start digitizing. So here is uh, the panel. We can click here on toggle editing. So the peaks layer is now ready for editing. And um, with this button, we can add the feature. So if it's points, it looks like this. If it's lines, it looks like a line. A polygon looks like a polygon. But for the rest, the functioning is uh, pretty much the same. Um, so let's do our first uh, point here. Let's take uh, this one. Bit hard to read, but that's a uh, part of the game. And this is just a demonstration, so let's put it here. It's our first point, and it auto generates the FID. So this is the, the feature ID, and it starts giving it a unique number from one onwards. And I can type here uh, the elevation, so 1626 or something. And I can give it the name. Mount, I think it's Marcy. So that's our first point. Let's do another one to, uh, to repeat this. So this one, Mount Haystack. So again, it auto generates the, the ID. It's uh, 1672. Two maybe hard to read. It's just an example. You can of course read it from the uh, from the lines if you interpolate them, the, the contour lines. Okay, right, haystack. So we have here two points. I will. Um, you can now save it, or if you need to delete one, you can use the selection. Then you can select the point and click the trash bin, then it will be deleted. I'll not do that now. Uh, you can undo things, um, so you can play around with that uh, functionality. Um, I want now to unselect everything, so it's not selected anymore. Also remember that as long as you're seeing this pencil at the layer, you're in editing mode. So it means this is still in memory. This is not in, 
in the file yet, so you need to save it. Now, if you click save, then it's stored in the file and almost carved in stone. If you want to undo things, better not click the save button in general, but click then the toggle editing. And if you do discard, you can continue from the last uh, hard save that you, you did. So, but in this case, I want to save it. So now the points are in the file. If I click right, I can open the attribute table and I find here the uh, attributes. And these are the two attributes that we have uh, entered. So that's what you can do with uh, points. So now I'm gonna demonstrate lines. I'm going to do uh, a river, part of a river. I'm not gonna do uh, a whole river. And uh, the idea is to do some uh, tributaries. And let's do this part. So I'm gonna create in the same way a new geo package layer. I use this to select the database that we already have because we remember we can put everything in our geo package that we digitize. So we can mix points, lines, and polygons. So I choose the same database, but now I call the table name rivers. And I choose here line. Don't forget to choose the right projection. And I want the name of the river as text data. Don't forget to click this button to add it here. And uh, that's basically all I want at this moment for uh, the rivers. It, if I click OK, it gives this pop-up, new geo package layer. It says the file already exists. So do you want to override the existing file with a new database or add a new layer to it? Obviously, we want to add the new layer to the existing database. So we click this one. So now they are both in the database. And uh, I'm going to digitize it. And then I'll show you how, in the end, I'll show you how the database looks like. By the way, if I hover my mouse over the layers, I can see the projection and I can see where it's stored. So it refers now to the Mount Marcy Geo Package database and the layer name Rivers. So toggle on the editing. And here I'm going to just start somewhere on this river. Make sure that also the layer is on the top, otherwise you're digitizing below. That's a mistake is often made. You have to do this very precisely so better to zoom in well. If you need to pen your screen, you can press the space bar and move your mouse. So you can then easily move and continue. There we go. Now the trick is to, with rivers, to digitize it from the upstream to the downstream and to put a node where a tributary joins, because we're going to add that tributary later. Uh, or in fact, this is the tributary, so I can, uh, can stop it here. And I can continue from that side. It's just a matter of uh, choice. Uh, so if you use the right mouse button, you can stop the digitizing. If I do the backspace, I go one node back. So you see that I can do that. Yeah. So I'll just stop it here. Then it auto-generates. Uh, the feature ID, and I can write here, book. I just type book, I know the name is a bit longer, but just for the demo, I write here book. We'll work on the styling later, so it got a bit of light color, so it's a bit invisible. I'm gonna now add this other one here. But before I do that, I'm going to switch on the snapping options, because you want these rivers really to connect to each other. So I click right, and then there is this uh, snapping toolbar here. And I can activate it by clicking on the magnet. And we can change it to a tolerance of meters. And I can set it, for example, to 15 meters. And then here you can choose if it has to snap to all the layers or only the active layers. I keep it on the default old layers. There's only just one relevant here. Uh, here you can choose if it needs to snap to a vertex or also to a segment. I want it only to a vertex in this case. And here's some other settings. Um, so now I've set the snapping, and it means that if I come close to the point within 15 meters, you see that it highlights. So when I start digitizing from the uh, upstream to the downstream and I come closer, I'll just do this stretch here, then it will snap. 
we can use the space bar to pen, remember? Do it a bit rougher than you will do in a real case. And you see when I come close, that it simply snaps to this point. This avoids that we have dangling nodes and undershoots or overshoots. And then I can simply uh, continue with this line. Do it a bit rough now. We just have something. And then you can give uh, the name there. Let's call this one. Uh, I'll also call this Brook because I'm going to show you how to make this one river later. So I have here two stretches and I call them Brook and I can now save it or just toggle the editing and say save because I'm done with uh, this. And when I open the attribute table, I see here two features. If I select a feature, it becomes yellow. You can see it here. We see this one is that is feature ID one and the other is feature ID number two. Now, if I want to consider them as one, I need to dissolve the two lines. I'm gonna unselect um, these things. And to dissolve, we use a vector uh, processing tool. It's called dissolve here. Yeah. And I'm gonna dissolve rivers. I'm going to dissolve based on the name because if I give similar features the same name, I can use or a similar ID or a number or a letter, then I can dissolve it so it becomes one feature with this function. So that's what I'm going to do. So everything that's called Brook will now be one feature. And I'm gonna store this to our geo package, of course, save to geo package. And it's in the webinar uh, folder, chapter one. I choose our geo package. And I give the name uh, river dissolve. Save. There you see this whole string being entered, but that just means put it in the right uh, place in the geo data, but in the uh, geo package. And then I run, it's done. And here's the result. And if I check the uh, attribute table, we can see now that the whole thing is now one feature if I select it. So that's what you can do if you want to have one river, including all its tributaries being one feature. Yeah. I unselect it. And the next thing that we can do is the lakes. So take one that's not too big for this purpose of the, the webinar. This is a nice small one. I'll just give it a fictitious uh, name just to save a bit of time. So similar procedure, go to layer, create layer, new geo package layer. I choose our existing database. I'll call it lakes. I understood that uh, you couldn't see the attribute table. I think I need to uh, change it to share the, the whole screen. I think that's better. So uh, I'll, I'll just uh, change. I hope that was the only thing that you missed. Um, so let me change it to share the whole screen. So I'm sure that you don't miss anything. So you should be able now to see all the windows. So sorry for not seeing the, the attribute table. Okay, so we have here the lakes and uh, I'll put it at polygon. Don't forget to change it to the projection that we're using. And also here, I just want the name of the lake, it's text data, add it to the fields, that's okay. Add new layer, that's what we learned previously, and it will be added to our database. And I toggle the editing, and now we can see here at the polygon, and I can start adding the boundaries of the polygon. I do it a bit rough, of course, in reality, you do this very precisely as an expert. But you see that digitizing also depends a lot on the resolution of your scan. So here it starts impacting. And I click uh, right to close the polygon. And then I get this pop-up, how to generate the ID. And as a name, I put here uh, some lake. Let's call it some lake. There it is, this is our lake. And well, sometimes here also we have lakes which have uh, islands. 
And what you can do is click right and go to the advanced digitizing panel. Uh, sorry, we need the advanced digitizing toolbar, not the panel. Uh, that's this one under toolbars here. And here you have these options of adding a ring, add a part, fill ring, etc. So you can play with that if you have islands in your polygons. So I'm not going to do that in this uh, webinar. So I'm simply going to switch it off and save uh, this layer. And what's left now is to, uh, to style it a little bit. And uh, it's very nice that Kurt uh, explained that in the book. So I'm trying to, to do that a little bit. So let's, uh, let me take the book with me. And let's go to the peaks and uh, style these points. And the nice thing is that uh, for styling these peaks, he used uh, the, uh, an SVG marker. So uh, let's uh, zoom to this layer. We see here our a point here that we're going to style, well, Marcy. And I go to the live layer styling panel. I'm gonna move my video a bit away. And what we're going to do now is uh, by default, it is uh, using a simple marker, but we're going to change that. So I'm gonna click here on simple marker and I'm going to choose here an SVG marker. And QGIS comes with a lot of preset uh, SVG files. These are uh, vector uh, yeah, symbology. And if I scroll down, I see here the SVG groups. And they're grouped per theme. And I need the one of a symbol. And I'm going to use this red symbol. And there it is. I selected it now. And I'm just going to change uh, the size of this. So what I uh, would like to see is uh, the width and the height in 12 uh, millimeters. There it is. And now we see that we have this beautiful marker on the screen and it's uh, fixed to 12 millimeters. Now I also want to uh, label these uh, peaks so I can go here to label it. I have to choose uh, the column, uh, the field in the attribute table to use to uh, label it but I can also open the uh, expression uh, dialog. So I'm using here single uh, labels and here I can choose the column or I can choose an expression. And what we want here is both the name and the elevation. So I'm going to build an expression. So if I click here, it opens the expression editor. And um, I'm gonna remove this. I'm going to build an, uh, an expression where we have the name and it's a uh, good practice to go here to uh, fields and values where you see the different uh, columns that we have in the attribute table. If I double click on name, it comes here in quotes, double quotes. So double quote means the column that we have in the attribute table. And you see here in the output preview that it says Mount Marcy. With this button, I can um, concatenate strings, which means I can connect it to another string, which uh, is in our case the uh, elevation but I want the elevation on a new line. And uh, we can use their, um, this uh, string, we can type it here. It, if we want to type a string anyways, we use single uh, quotes. So I can type here anything and I put it here under single quotes and you see here that it's added. Yeah, and if I want a space, I put a space before. But I want here a new line, and this is a special special character, which is nicely put here in the preset button. So if I click here, I get a new line. And you see now it jumps to the next line. And I want to concatenate it then with, uh, with the uh, elevation. So I go here to elevation. If I double click, it puts here the elevation value. And I also want, to have the units there. So I'm going to use a single quote and a space. Space is important, then there's a space there. Now I have it in meters. So this is basically how uh, we can add uh, a new line and a string and uh, combine it with our columns of the attribute table. So that looks okay. There are all other kinds of things we can do like formatting the numbers, etc. It's uh, covered in the book, but this is, uh, so this is basically what we, what we have here. And of course, now we need to make it a bit, need to make it a bit more uh, visible. So what I'm going to do is um, going to uh, the font style here and uh, make it uh, bold. So now it's bold. And so I'd like to have it a little bit uh, bigger, 
we'll do that uh, later. So we're gonna use here a label buffer here, and I draw a text buffer, so it becomes a bit clearer uh, readable. And I'm going to give it a bit more uh, space by using this button, and there I can uh, set a distance of two units, for example, and now you see that it's nicely placed next to our uh, marker. And there's some nice uh, hidden options here, a uh, lot of hidden options in the, uh, in the label uh, uh, generator. So if you go here, you have automated placement settings. And what you can do here is to allow, to disallow truncated labels on edges of the map. So if I just uncheck this, and then if it goes to the side, you see now it jumps. So it makes sure that all your labels are still visible even when they're on the edge of your map. So that's a nice uh, option in uh, QGIS. And um, yeah, so that's basically uh, what I would like to show for the styling of the peaks. Now we can style uh, the rivers. Got a few minutes for that. I'm gonna use uh, this dissolved one. Go to the styling. And uh, there, we're going to click on simple line. And there are very many types of changing your colors here. Uh, but if you click here on the color, then you can put an RGB value. And uh, in the book, we have used uh, this combination to get a nice uh, blue line for the river. And 180. And then we have this nice blue color. We go back here. Uh, let me zoom to a river there. Now you see it's blue but it's still a bit small. So we're going to change the stroke width to 0 0.86. So now we have the river in uh, bigger blue. So lots of things you can uh, change here. And then we go to uh, the labels. We want uh, single labels. And we want the name of the river. Now you see it here, Brook. And um, yeah, what is nice about uh, the placement option for the river is to put it on a uh, curved. Now, Brook is a bit of a short name, but if you have a longer name, it will curve nicely around uh, the river. So that's a nice thing you can do. And to make it more readable, you can also uh, change uh, the buffer color that you put around it. So we'll draw a text buffer here, but it's white, so it's still quite prominent. And uh, the background is uh, mostly green. So I can go here to the uh, drop down of the color and I can choose here pick color and now I can choose the green of the map and you see that it's now a bit hidden this buffer and it comes really nice out of uh, of the map so that's a nice uh, tip if you want to use this buffer use the background color of the map okay then I go here uh, to the, the text and also we want uh, the, the color of the, the text to be uh, blue, because that's nice for the river. So you can use the RGB values of uh, 31, 38, and 180 here. And now our rivers have a blue uh, label. Also nice to change the fonts. So we can use here uh, Calibri or something. Oh, went a bit too fast. And we can change the size. Let's make it a bit bigger, which is uh, 11, and make it uh, italic. So these are things uh, that we can simply uh, change there. And the last few minutes I'll spend on uh, styling uh, the lakes. So let's switch to the lakes. So here you can always see which layer is uh, selected. And uh, I'm going to style it. So I'll go here. And we choose again this uh, simple fill. And in this case, I'm going to use the shape burst fill. Of course, it's good if we would see now the lake that we digitized. So it's here. And you see now that the shape burst fill has this gradient uh, kind of fill. And what we're going to do is uh, to, uh, to change these two colors that we use. We're going to use this uh, two color uh, shape burst fill. And this first color we are going to set to, uh, so it needs to be, of course, bluish, like with lakes that make sense. So we use 31 and the 33 and 180 here. So that's nice blue. And for the second color, 
Oh, sorry, that was for the first color. I have to switch it around. Um, so let's do that again. Live demos with a book next to me. <laughs> it's always exciting. So it was 185, 239, and 255 for this one. And then for the other color, we use 31 and the 33. And 180. So now it already starts making a bit of sense, but it's not completely what we want. So uh, let's uh, change here some parameters. I would like to use a distance of uh, six. That always works well. And I'm gonna make a blur strength of 12. And you see now that it's a nice blurred uh, lake. But we also want a boundary around the lake. So I'm also going to add a second uh, renderer here. And, and there I'm going to use a simple line. And then for that uh, line, I'm going to use also a blue color. So I will use here 31 and the 33 and 180, the same as the second color that we had. So then uh, the outline becomes also clear. Um, so you can play around with these things. Let's also label the lake like we labeled the other things. So I'm gonna use a single label here and I'm gonna use the name field, it's already selected. And I'm going to set the label color there to uh, also um, to blue. So I'm gonna use 255, 255 and 255, and that's white, sorry. I want it white because then it comes nice out of the blue. And there I'm going to set the size to 10 points, I'll keep it like this. I will style it um, bold and italic, or maybe it's better, bold and italic. I can't choose that. Yeah. So you can play around with these settings to, uh, to make that nicer. Um, change the placement, the horizontal. Now it gets nicely into the lake. That's a nice option there. And um, yeah, if your lake names are very large, then here's a nice option on the formatting where you can choose a wrap on the on character. Um, let's see where that is here. You can wrap it on the character if you want. Or you can set it here. So there are different options here you can, uh, can play with. Um, lots of options actually. And that's basically what I wanted to explain to you. So you can always save your project all the time. You can save it even to uh, your geo package. That's something new in uh, this uh, version. So let's see if I can uh, use it here, Mount Marcy, and I'm gonna give it a new name. Let's call this uh, um, Marcy, well, maybe, maybe webinar one. Okay, and now the project is saved in the geo package. If I go now to the browser panel, and I go to uh, this uh, folder for the webinar, then chapter one, and I find here our database, and everything that we have stored is in that database, even our project. And I can even put the raster of my Marcy in the database. I simply drag it there and the import was successful. So now also our geo package has uh, the raster in it. So it contains raster, vector, everything. We can even put our styles in that, but that will come another time. So um, I'm gonna, go back to you guys and uh, i hope things are going well let me uh, invite kurt back uh, let me see if i can unmute him hey yes. here i am hi how did it go were there many questions was it visible uh, what is the experience of the participants well it looks to me like it um came through very well and there were there were a lot of questions that i answered along the way so um, we had a good active discussion going while you were showing us how to do all that Great. So, yeah, I think it went very well. That's great. Um, good to hear that. 
Um, are there any general things you want to summarize, uh, Kurt, from the chat? Um, no, just to mention, like you did, that this was a very quick run through of, of that chapter, and there's a lot more detail in the actual um, open courseware or the exercise out of the book. So um, I encourage everyone to, to go through that in their own time if they're wanting to take a deeper dive into this. Mm -hmm. Great, yes, that's good advice. I think we can uh, also go to the slides where uh, we can uh, recommend a few uh, uh, trainings and, uh, and talk a bit about the book. So I'm gonna share uh, the presentation back. Um, so first of all, to repeat that uh, 22nd of March is World Water Day and uh, you will get 30% discount on the ebook from now until uh, Sunday. If you go to uh, locatepress.com slash hid and you use the, the code QGIS Hydro, you get 30%. And it's really nice to have the book next to this webinar to, to follow the steps. There's also more that we have. So there are all kinds of uh, course, free course materials at IHE Delft uh, with our open courseware. So there's the website gisopencourseware.org. Uh, I will uh, share uh, the screen uh, and show you where that is. That's here. So here you can find uh, all kinds of free materials, including exercises like the one that we did, but not as good described as in the, in the book. There's exercises on uh, GDAL, uh, on Python, and uh, field surveys with uh, input and merging. And I really have to uh, mention that I'm so happy that uh, Lutra Consulting sponsored uh, this session to go over 100 participants. And we see that it was really necessary because we have uh, at this moment 144 uh, concurrent uh, participants. So uh, that's really great. And Lutra Consulting has developed uh, the 3D viewer of uh, QGIS, the uh, input app and the merging application for uh, using the field and synchronizing with QGIS. So definitely uh, worth. Uh, looking at. And uh, there's also a collection of uh, video tutorials here organized in uh, playlists. And in my uh, YouTube channel, uh, you can find many more videos with instructions also for this exercise that we, uh, that we did. So have a look. It's also about uh, Python and PC Raster. And, uh, yeah, hope you will enjoy those. Uh, let me switch back to uh, the other screen. So what we also have at IHE is uh, short courses for professionals like you. Uh, we can, uh, it, there's one that's called QGIS for Hydrological Applications and uh, Kurt has been with me doing that in the last two years. And in the last one, uh, we had a lot of fun also uh, uh, doing mapathons and uh, presenting our book. So the next one will be from uh, 14 to 18 September in, uh, in Delft. So if you want a course that is certified, you can uh, come there and stay uh, five days with us. Uh, if you need more information, go to the IHE Delft website or contact me and I can uh, give you the information. The links are also on the OpenCourseWare website. These are paid courses, uh, but you will get uh, support and you will get the official QGIS certificate. Another option, if you don't want to come to Delft or can't afford it, or the corona crisis is going on, uh, you can always do online courses. And we have an online course together with uh, Newland Geo information. Um, if you want to do that one, you can also get the official certificate and you get uh, support. It's uh, now only a basic course, but uh, together with Kurt, we will develop over the next uh, weeks also a full-blown uh, online course on QGIS for hydrological applications. So also stay tuned on that. Uh, Kurt also uh, has some nice stuff to tell. Yeah, so in the shameless plug department here, and given that um, what we're all facing right now with this COVID crisis, um, I've developed a program over the last several years called Community Health Maps. And this is uh, part of democratizing technology. Um, so this is using all open tools like QGIS to help um, public health workers and communities um, manage disease outbreaks and, and any kind of health concerns a community may have. So with, with uh, taking inspiration from Hans um, getting this webinar going, I'm planning on setting up um, a series of webinars that go through the community health maps workflow for people um, in the next, look for that in the next month or so, I'll, I'll make that available. So the, the website is communityhealthmaps.org and there, are, there is some open courseware on there and an online tutorial as well. And this is um, showing um, people how to do various things, collect data with a smartphone using things like input or QField or Fulcrum, then bringing that data into QGIS um, 
to do some spatial analysis and mapping, and finally using something like Mapbox to set up uh, an online web mapping platform um, with the data that's collected. So I'll be setting up something in the next couple of weeks, so look for that. Very nice. So go have a look at that, it's really great. So uh, what we'll do uh, next week uh, in this web weekly uh, webinar is uh, going to explain how to import tabular data like uh, Excel sheets into QGIS, uh, somebody's drawing on the screen, <laughs> uh, to join uh, attribute tables and to interpolate uh, points to a uh, raster. Um, so I hope you will also join uh, next week and keep the hashtag uh, QGIS Hydro if you want to communicate on Twitter about this. And uh, yeah, if you need anything from Kurt and me, then uh, you can stay in touch on social media in the meantime. And I would like to invite you all for uh, the geo beers now. That's something that we have in the geo world that we have drinks together and uh, chat about everything in our lives, including, of course, a lot of geo. And in this time of the COVID crisis here on the COVID online campus, we're going to do it online. So if you want to join us, then uh, yeah, I would like to uh, have a beer with you, have a drink. And uh, so cheers. I will, I will unmute you and let's see what happens. <laughs> but thank you all. I will stop also the video recording here and I'll stop the, well, not stop the share. I think that's okay to have the share there. Let me see how I get back. No, I need to stop the share. I'm gonna unmute the participants and let's this work with you guys. Cheers. <laughs> already see some nice people here. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the webinar. <laughs> Cheers, y'all. Cheers, uh, Keith. Cheers. Show them pinch. Wow, this is cool. Oh, that's what she's uh, the oh, Prost. Prost, we say in Dutch, yes. <laughs> Yeah, this is Samson from Kenya. Hello.